Ever had a headache and thought, maybe I should drill a hole in my head? No? Well, you clearly weren't a doctor in ancient times. Welcome to the wacky world of historical medicine, where the treatments ranged from the bizarre to the downright terrifying. From munching on mummies to taking a bath in electric light, our ancestors had some, let's say, unique ideas about healthcare. So, grab your leeches and your lucky rabbit's foot as we dive into the most unusual medical practices through history. Disclaimer. Please don't try any of these at home. Plague doctors, the beaked saviors. In the 17th century, when the bubonic plague was more popular in Europe than the latest fashion, a peculiar figure emerged. The plague doctor. Dressed in a long overcoat and a bird-like mask, these doctors looked more like they were ready for a masquerade ball than medical practice. The beaked mask wasn't just for show, it was filled with aromatic items like herbs, spices, or dried flowers. Why? Because they believed the plague was spread through miasma, or bad air. The idea was that these sweet smells would counteract the bad air. It's like trying to solve air pollution with a scented candle. The outfit didn't stop at the mask. Plague doctors also wore a wide-brimmed hat, which was a common sign of a doctor at the time, and a long overcoat made of waxed leather. They looked like a cross between a bird and a leather salesman. The coat wasn't just fashionable, it was thought to protect the doctor from miasma. They also carried a cane, which they used to examine patients without getting too close. Social distancing, 17th century style. But here's the kicker. Most plague doctors weren't actually trained physicians. Many were second-rate doctors who couldn't find any other job, or sometimes not doctors at all. It's like hiring a clown for a birthday party and getting a mime. Their treatments were as unusual as their outfits. Bloodletting, leeches, and even chopping off infected body parts were all in a day's work. And let's not forget the burning of aromatic herbs to cleanse the air. Because when you're dealing with a deadly plague, why not add a bit of aromatherapy into the mix? Despite their ominous appearance and questionable medical practices, plague doctors were a symbol of hope in a time of despair. They braved the streets and homes stricken by the plague, offering whatever help they could. So, next time you visit the doctor, just be thankful they don't show up in a bird mask carrying a stick. Trepanation. A hole in the head. If you ever thought modern medicine had some wacky ideas, let's drill into the past with trepanation, the practice of boring holes into the skull. It's like ancient DIY brain surgery, but without the YouTube tutorial. Trepanation is one of the oldest surgical procedures, dating back to the Neolithic period. Back then, if you had a headache, seizures, or even mental disorders, the solution was simple. Let's open up your skull. It's like fixing a computer by just randomly removing parts and hoping for the best. The process involved scraping, cutting, or drilling a hole into the skull using primitive tools like flint or bronze instruments. Anesthesia? Not really a thing. Pain management was more along the lines of bite down on this stick and think happy thoughts. But here's the twist. Some people actually survived this procedure. Skulls have been found with signs of healing around the holes, indicating that patients lived for years after the operation. It's like they walked off having a hole in their head as if it were just a bad haircut. Now, you might be wondering, why on earth did they think this was a good idea? Well, ancient practitioners believed that trepanation could cure physical and mental ailments by releasing evil spirits or relieving pressure in the brain. It's like they saw the brain as a pressure cooker that occasionally needed venting. Did you know that from a modern medical perspective, there's a tiny grain of truth in this ancient practice? Today, similar procedures are used in emergency medicine to relieve pressure from bleeding or swelling in the brain, like after a severe head injury. Of course, these days it's done with precision instruments, in sterile environments, and with the patient under anesthesia. So, while trepanation might sound barbaric, it was an early attempt to understand and treat brain-related issues. So, next time you have a headache, maybe just stick to aspirin. Leave the skull drilling to the professionals. Mummy powder, the ancient Egyptian panacea. Let's unwrap the curious case of mummy powder, a medical marvel of the medieval world that was, well, exactly what it sounds like. If you ever thought your protein powder was hardcore, think again. Back in medieval Europe, ground-up mummies were all the rage in medicine. Yes, actual mummies, as in the embalmed bodies of ancient Egyptians. It's like someone looked at a mummy and thought, you know what? This could cure the plague. 
The process was simple yet macabre. Take one part mummy, grind it into powder, and voila. You've got yourself a remedy for everything from headaches to stomach ulcers. It's like the ancient version of a multivitamin, but with more… personality. But where did they get the mummies? Well, it turns out there was quite the trade in mummified remains. Grave robbers in Egypt would dig up ancient tombs, and the mummies would make their way to European apothecaries. It's like the black market, but with more bandages and curses. The use of mummy powder was based on a misunderstanding. Europeans misinterpreted the Arabic word for bitumen, a natural substance used in mummification, as mummia, or mummy. They believed that the preservation properties of mummification could be transferred to the living. It's like thinking eating pickles will make you immortal because they don't spoil quickly. So, the next time you're browsing the pharmacy, just be thankful that the only mummies you'll encounter are probably in the Halloween aisle. The Tobacco Smoke Enema Blowing Smoke Now let's puff our way into the 18th century, where tobacco smoke enemas were all the rage in medical circles. Yes, you heard that right. It's like someone saw smoke and thought, let's put that where the sun doesn't shine. The tobacco smoke enema was believed to be a cure-all for various ailments, from colds to hernias, and even, oddly enough, for reviving drowning victims. The logic was as clear as a smoggy day in London. Tobacco was thought to warm the body and stimulate respiration. It's like giving CPR, but with more carcinogens. The procedure was simple yet bizarre. A tube was inserted, well, you can guess where, and tobacco smoke was blown into the patient's body. This was often done with the help of a bellows, because why do things by half measures? It's like a barbecue, but instead of smoking meat, it's… well, let's not go there. This practice became so popular that tobacco enema kits were a common sight, especially near bodies of water, just in case someone needed a quick, smoky revival. It's like having a first aid kit today but with more… pizzazz? But wait, it gets even stranger. There were reports of people self-administering tobacco smoke enemas, believing in their health benefits. It's like the 18th century version of a spa day, but with less relaxation and more coughing. Thankfully, by the 19th century, the medical community realized that blowing smoke up someone's backside was, well, just blowing smoke. The practice fell out of favor, and tobacco found its place in cigars, cigarettes, and the occasional stern lecture from your doctor. So. Next time you're considering a wellness retreat, just be grateful that tobacco smoke enemas are not on the menu. Corpse Medicine, the Dead as a Drugstore In the Renaissance, if you thought your local pharmacy was lacking, you clearly hadn't tried the corpse aisle. Yes, you heard that right. Corpse medicine was a thing, and it was exactly what it sounds like, using bits of the deceased in the hope of curing the living. It's like recycling, but with more, um, body parts. This macabre practice involved using bones, blood, and other less savory parts of the human body in medical concoctions. It's like someone took the phrase, you are what you eat, a bit too literally. The belief was that the vitality of the dead could be transferred to the living. It's like a very grim energy drink. Mummy powder, made from ground-up mummies imported from Egypt, was particularly popular. It was used for everything from stopping bleeding to curing ulcers. It's like the ancient version of a multi-purpose kitchen gadget, but for your body and significantly creepier. But it wasn't just mummies. Blood was also a hot commodity. Freshly executed criminals were sometimes surrounded by a crowd eager to collect their blood. It was believed that drinking the blood of a strong young person could cure epilepsy and other ailments. It's like a very morbid wine tasting. Even King Charles II of England got in on the action. He created his own remedy called the King's Drops, which was basically alcohol mixed with human skull. It's like a cocktail, but with a twist that nobody asked for. Thankfully, as medical science advanced, the use of corpse medicine began to decline. Turns out consuming parts of a dead body wasn't the healthiest choice. Who would have thought, right? Soothing syrups, the opium solution for babies. Let's take a stroll down the pharmacy aisle of the 19th century, where soothing syrups for babies were all the rage. And by soothing, we mean laced with opium. Yes, that's right. Nothing says goodnight, baby, like a dose of narcotics. These syrups, with names like Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup and Godfrey's Cordial, were marketed as a cure for teething pain, coughs, and other infant ailments. The secret ingredient? A hefty helping of morphine or opium. 
It's like they took the phrase, sleep like a baby, a little too literally. Parents, tired from constant crying and sleepless nights, turn to these syrups for a bit of peace and quiet. After all, who needs a lullaby when you've got liquid opium? It's like the 19th century version of a white noise machine, but with more side effects. The problem, aside from the obvious, was that these syrups were incredibly addictive and dangerous. Babies would often become dependent on them, and overdoses were tragically common. It's like playing Russian roulette, but with a medicine dropper. By the early 20th century, people started realizing that maybe, just maybe, giving opium to babies wasn't the best idea. Laws and regulations were put in place, and these soothing syrups slowly disappeared from the shelves, much to the relief of babies and their livers everywhere. So, next time you hear a baby crying, just be thankful that the solution these days is more rock a baby and less opium for all. Animal dung, a questionable remedy. Let's dive into a rather smelly chapter of medical history, the use of animal dung as a remedy. Yes, in the days before modern medicine, if you had an ailment, the answer might just have been found in the barnyard. It's like they saw animal waste and thought, that ought to fix it. From ancient Egypt to medieval Europe, animal dung was used for a variety of medical treatments. Got a wound? Slap some cow dung on it. Suffering from a skin condition? How about a nice dung bath? It's like the old saying, if you can't cure it, cow poop it. Okay, maybe that wasn't an old saying, but it should have been. Different types of dung were used for different ailments. For example, dog dung was believed to cure sore throats. It's unclear how they discovered this, and perhaps it's best not to ask. Pigeon droppings were used to treat baldness, because nothing says full head of hair like bird poop. The logic behind using dung was a mix of magical thinking and observation. Dung was warm, and warmth was often associated with life and healing. Plus, it was readily available, and when it comes to medieval medicine, convenience was key. But wait, there's more. Dung wasn't just for external use. Oh no. It was also ingested. That's right, people ate this stuff. It's like the worst dietary supplement imaginable. Modern science, of course, tells us that using animal waste in medicine is not only ineffective, but also potentially harmful. Who would have guessed that rubbing waste on wounds could lead to infections? So, next time you step in something unpleasant, just be thankful you're not expected to use it as medicine. It's one of the few times where stepping in it might actually be the better outcome. Radiation rave, the glowing trend. Let's illuminate the curious case of the radiation craze in the early 20th century, where glowing health was taken a bit too literally. Back then, radiation was the new black, and radium was its shining star. It's like they discovered a glow-in-the-dark paint and thought, let's put that in everything. In the early 1900s, the discovery of radium by Marie and Pierre Curie sparked a glowing revolution. Suddenly, radium was everywhere, in toothpaste, cosmetics, health tonics, and even in chocolate. It's like they thought adding a bit of radioactive sparkle would make everything better. One of the most bizarre products was radium water, touted as a health tonic. People drank this glowing concoction hoping to cure everything from arthritis to impotence. It's like sipping on a nightlight for health. Then there were the radium spas, where you could bathe in radioactive water. It was the spa day from hell, with a side of radiation. And let's not forget the radium-infused cosmetics, because who doesn't want a radioactive blush for that natural glow? We now know that exposure to radioactive materials like radium can cause serious health issues, including cancer. Radium is particularly hazardous because it can substitute for calcium in bones, leading to bone cancer and other disorders. The glowing trend of the early 20th century was a dangerous dance with an invisible and misunderstood threat. The tragic story of the radium girls, factory workers who painted watch dials with radium paint, highlights the dangers. They often licked their brushes to get a fine point, ingesting radium in the process. Many suffered severe health issues as a result. It's a cautionary tale of the risks of new technologies and the importance of understanding their long-term effects. So next time you're looking for that perfect skin cream or health tonic, maybe check that it doesn't glow in the dark. Just a tip. Electric shock therapy, a jolting treatment. Now let's switch on the story of electric shock therapy, a treatment that really puts the shock in shocking. In the world of medical history, this one's a real zapper. 
It's like someone saw lightning and thought, hey, why not use that to cure what ails you? Electric shock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, began gaining traction in the early 20th century. The idea was simple yet startling. Send electric currents through the brain to treat mental illnesses. It's like rebooting a computer, but the computer is your brain, and the reboot involves a lot more voltage. The procedure was initially used without anesthesia, which, as you can imagine, was not a pleasant experience. Patients often experienced seizures, memory loss, and a whole host of other side effects. It's like getting the worst haircut of your life, but instead of losing hair, you lose memories. But here's the shocker, pun intended. In some cases, it worked. ECT proved effective for certain conditions like severe depression. It's like finding out that the crazy idea your uncle had at the family BBQ actually has some merit. Over time, ECT has evolved. Modern ECT is much safer, typically performed under anesthesia with controlled currents. It's still used today, albeit in a much more refined and humane manner. It's like going from a sledgehammer to a scalpel in terms of precision. So, next time you're feeling a bit down, maybe just stick to ice cream and sad movies. Leave the electric shocks to the professionals. Snake oil, the original fake news. Finally, let's slither into the slippery world of snake oil, the original fake news of medicine. Long before the internet was flooded with dubious health claims, snake oil salesmen were the kings of cure-all concoctions. It's like they looked at a snake and thought, this could cure everything from baldness to broken hearts. The term snake oil originally referred to an actual product brought to the US by Chinese laborers working on the Transcontinental Railroad. This genuine snake oil was made from the oil of Chinese water snakes and was used to treat joint pain. It's like the early version of a pain relief ointment, but with more scales. However, as snake oil gained popularity, enterprising American salesmen saw an opportunity. They started peddling their own versions of snake oil, which often contained little to no actual snake oil. It's like ordering a beef burger and getting a veggie patty instead, not quite what was advertised. These faux snake oils were claimed to cure just about anything. Headache, snake oil, stomach ache, snake oil, existential dread, you guessed it, snake oil. It was the go-to solution for every ailment, real or imagined. The most infamous of these salesmen was Clark Stanley, the so-called rattlesnake king. He would put on dramatic demonstrations, killing rattlesnakes and extracting their oil, all in front of an awestruck crowd. It was part medicine, part magic show, and all spectacle. But like all good scams, the snake oil bubble eventually burst. In 1917, the government analyzed Stanley's snake oil and found it contained no actual snake oil. It was mostly mineral oil, a dash of beef fat, red pepper, and turpentine. It's like finding out your favorite superhero is just a guy in a costume. The term snake oil has since become synonymous with fraudulent products and false advertising. It's a reminder that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So, next time you see a miracle cure being peddled, remember the tale of the snake oil salesman. Sometimes the only thing being cured is your wallet. Arsenic, a toxic beauty. In our bonus round of historical medical oddities, let's explore the deadly allure of arsenic, a substance that was once as common in medicine cabinets as aspirin is today. It's like finding out that people used to sprinkle a little cyanide in their morning coffee for that extra kick. Arsenic, a naturally occurring element, has a Jekyll and Hyde personality. On one hand, it's notoriously poisonous, but on the other, it was once a sought-after beauty and health product. It's like the cosmetic equivalent of dating a pirate. Exciting, but you might lose an eye. In the Victorian era, arsenic was the go-to for that coveted pale, ghostly complexion. Women, and some men, would consume arsenic wafers or apply arsenic-laced cosmetics to achieve this look. It's like using Photoshop, but instead of a computer, you use a deadly poison. But why stop at beauty? Arsenic was also used as a medicine. Got a fever, asthma, or syphilis. Arsenic to the rescue. It was like the Tylenol of the 1800s, but with a slightly higher chance of death. Slimming, but deadly. Arsenic didn't just make you beautiful. It also promised to help you lose weight. Yes, arsenic was used in diet pills. It's like the early version of a weight loss supplement, but with the side effect of potentially killing you. Talk about a killer diet. People would take small doses, 
believing it would boost their metabolism and help them shed pounds. The logic was simple, yet fatally flawed. What doesn't kill you makes you thinner. It's like playing Russian roulette with your bathroom scale. Arsenic was so popular that it found its way into everyday products. It was in wallpapers, clothing dyes, and even children's toys. It's like discovering your entire house is decorated in 50 shades of toxic. The most infamous example was the green wallpaper. Arsenic was used to create a vibrant green pigment called Shields Green. This wallpaper adorned many homes, slowly releasing arsenic fumes, especially in damp conditions. It's like living in a salad bowl, if the salad were made of poison. Eventually, the lethal side effects of arsenic could no longer be ignored. As cases of mysterious illnesses and deaths piled up, the link to arsenic became clear. It's like realizing that the magic elixir you've been drinking is actually villainous potion. By the early 20th century, the use of arsenic in products was largely phased out. It went from a household staple to a cautionary tale in the annals of medical history. It's like breaking up with that pirate. Exciting times, but you're better off without them. Did you know modern medicine still uses arsenic? but in a much safer and controlled way. Arsenic trioxide is used in chemotherapy for a specific type of leukemia. It's a classic case of an old dog learning new tricks, with the dog being a deadly element and the tricks being life-saving medical treatments.